Welcome to MicroCollege, a podcast exploring innovative, place-based, and humanly scaled responses to the crises in higher education, meaning, and discourse in our time. Everyone knows that colleges and universities are at a breaking point, but what can be done? I'm Jacob Hunt, the director of Thoreau College, a micro-college in Viroqua, Wisconsin. Join us each week as we tackle this question head on. Welcome to MicroCollege. This week on the podcast, we are really thrilled to have as a special guest, Professor John Verveke. John Verveke is professor, uh, associate professor at the University of Toronto. He teaches courses in the psychology department on thinking and reasoning with an emphasis on insight, problem solving, cognitive development with an emphasis on the dynamical nature of development and higher cognitive processes with an emphasis on intelligence, rationality, mindfulness, and the psychology of wisdom. He is also the author of Zombies in Western Culture, A 21st Century Crisis, and the creator and the creator of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, which is a 50-part YouTube series addressing the meaning crisis from, from many different perspectives, including philosophy, history, uh, cognitive science, and, and many other dimensions. And um, he is, he is uh, a practitioner of, of uh, meditation, uh, mindfulness, Vipassana meditation, and Tai Chi Chuan. Um, and really, uh, John, I think it's been really exciting to dive into your to your work, just because you are such an example of a person who is is has so much enthusiasm for what you're doing, and has found you know I think you're really modeling one approach to to meeting the meeting crisis by uh, by finding a big problem, a big question, and really diving into it. And I really appreciate you speaking with us this week. It's my pleasure, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So here on, on MicroCollege, our, our focus is on young adults and on, on undergraduate education. And so we, we like to begin every week with a little bit of storytelling. Um, really. So I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about your, your own young adulthood. So where were you 18 to 20 years old? What were you doing? Who were you with? And what, were, what really were the transformative or the, the standout experiences from that period of your life? Oh, goodness. Um, so I had been brought up in my, as a child and, uh, early adult or adolescent, I should say, um, in a fundamentalist Christian household, um, that had left me, um, without realizing it quite traumatized and around eight, around by the time I was 18, I had come out of that and I was, uh, looking to go to, uh, university and at that time. I was quite militant, uh, a militant atheist, I guess you might put it. Um, and I was going through my own version of a meaning crisis as I had rejected the religion I had been brought up in quite comprehensively, but I was still suffering from its trauma, and I was still also suffering from the taste for the transcendent that it had left in my mouth. So 18 to 20, I was looking for alternatives. Um, to that fundamentalist Christianity and I initially encountered those alternatives in uh, the figure of Socrates when I took a uh, introduction to philosophy course uh, my first year of university and it had a profound impact on me uh, the wedding of rationality uh, dialogos spirituality the cultivation of wisdom uh, education uh, all had a profound impact on me, but as I went on in the academic philosophy, the, those topics of wisdom and transformation and transcendence um, generally fell off the table. There were some courses specifically on existentialism where they came back on mm. the table, but in general they, they fell off, and so I went looking for an alternative place, and I found a uh, a, a dojo that taught Vipassana meditation, meta contemplation, and Tai Chi Chuan as an ecology of practices, and that had a huge, huge impact on me. And so for a while, I was just, I went on in the academic philosophy because of, I appreciated the skills and the virtues it was teaching me. But I was leading sort of these two lives, and then 
what started to happen is I started to get introduced to the work of Pierre Hadot in ancient philosophy. I found this new discipline called cognitive science. Um, and the two, those two worlds started to come back together for me, the cultivation of wisdom and my academic and scientific pursuits. And I started to share those connections with my students. And when I did, I saw their light, their eyes just light up. And I started to realize that it wasn't just me idiosyncratically that was wrestling with these issues. A lot of people were wrestling with these issues uh, at about the same time in their lives where I had started wrestling seriously with them in mind. So <clears throat> I started teaching more and more about what I came to call the meaning crisis and about the need for an ecology of practices that helps people uh, awaken from it. That's the gist of my story, I guess. Yeah, so there's a real consistency and through line to what you're doing now from that elements of that story. So it's based yeah, on personal experience. So. Yeah, yeah, very much so, and it continues to be that way. It's become an aspirational ideal for me that my scientific work, my public work, and my private uh, practice all share a, a deep and ongoing and hopefully increasing integrity. Yeah, yeah, that really resonates with me. I mean, I think one of the things that, that I value about the, the micro college model, and again, we're talking about programs, we've had as few as four programs, four students in the program, and as many as 18. So that's the range. And when you're working with groups that small, there's no hiding your, your personal... <laughs> life you have to be authentic right and and, mm -hmm. and 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 also it has to to be resonant with the you could say the intellectual the academic content the stories that you're telling as well and so that's you know you're, you're operating in, in different sizes of institutions but it's clearly something that you you model really beautifully well thank you for saying that yeah so i, I um i think this this uh this question of um of, of dialogue di dialogos discussion um is, is, is clearly an important theme, the figure of Socrates. Um, I, just, I had the, the experience last week of uh, doing a guest uh, a presentation in the high school where I taught for many years, and we read, um, we read actually the, the allegory of the cave <laughs> from the Republic ah. um, with a group of high school seniors. Um, and these are, these, are, these are really engaged students at an alternative Waldorf High School. They do meditation, they do lots of embodied practices. Um, but you could see that that, that you know, Introduction to that story, and 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 we followed that up with with some basic um, epistemological discussions from from throughout the history of philosophy, and and that that really coming alive that you mentioned is something that um, that that you see there as well. There's a hunger for that that type of conversation. So I wonder if you could talk about um, about your your conception of dialogos. What 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 can we take from the story of Socrates uh, into into this ecology of practices that you're talking about? Well, first of all, I'll do some uh, a bit of shameless self-promotion. I've got a new series coming out, um, 25 episodes, um, called After Socrates, where I explore that question in great depth, not just theoretically, but I also teach, uh, you know, practices. Uh, that, so there's a whole pedagogical program of practices corresponding to the lecture, where I try to answer that question in depth. Uh, so the main thing uh, is there's a, there's a lot to learn from Socrates, but we can't wait around uh, for Socrates to appear, <laughs> um, which is the problem. So trying to be as true to the tradition and to the model of Socrates, where while also not anyone trying to take on the specific role of Socrates or, uh, or um, the exemplary status of Socrates is the, the trick uh, or the problem, I think is a better way for it, that I'm trying to reverse engineer. Mm -hmm. And so I took a, a deep clue from Thich Nhat Hanh's, um, it's almost a prophecy. He said the next Buddha will be at the Sangha, which is the community, right? Mm -hmm. um, the community in which the peop people are in fellowship in the cultivation of wisdom and enlightenment together. And so I've tried to structure uh, a practice that in which there are, are groups of four people and the group is acting as the Socrates for each one of the members. And it's a way of trying to get into something like a collective flow state in which you are trying to ask questions, to draw people out, to help midwife uh, <clears throat> their own understanding, uh, 
to get a sense of, as Socrates said, following the logos wherever it's willing to go, uh, so, such that the conversation and the logos of that conversation take on a life of their own. <clears throat> and that becomes the sage, as opposed, <clears throat> sorry, as opposed to any single human being in the group. And what you do is um, people first experience a profound kind of intimacy with each other, that intimacy of fellowship. Then they start to get a sense of the logos as a guiding presence. I, I don't mean that to sound creepy or spectral, mm -hmm. but that's the, the, the clearest phenomenological language, a guiding presence, and then they, they cultivate an intimacy with that. And then those two forms of intimacy, we may call it the horizontal intimacy with each other and the vertical intimacy with the logos, through them, almost stereoscopically, they start to sense an emerging capacity for falling in love with being itself. Um, and that, that is, I think, the ultimate way to respond to the meaning crisis, to, to reacquire the, fellow, the intimacy of fellowship and then the intimacy of participation in levels of ontological reality, that collective intelligence and what it discloses. And then finally, through that, an intimacy with the ground of being itself. I think that is the way to awaken from the meaning crisis. And people find these experiences uh, quite powerful. And we like, like Socrates, the focus of the practice is always a virtue. Might be wisdom, might mm -hmm. be honesty, precisely because of, of the way this question can't remain either merely impersonal or merely idiosyncratically personal. Socrates was always trying to get people out of both their egocentrism and out of simply deferring to third-person authority mm -hmm. and get into this transjective, transformative space. And that's what doing dialogos about uh, a virtue is. So we give people a bunch of practices, uh, that uh, a pedagogical program that scaffolds them into, a practice called dialectic that helps organize this. But you can't actually practice dialogos. You can practice dialectic in the aspirational hope that dialogos will catch fire mm -hmm. and uh, uh, emerge and, and draw people, draw all those presents into a co-emergence with it. That's yeah, that that's fantastic. Um, I definitely, you know, that the when moments in in Thoreau College and these these micro college spaces have gone well, like there's there's something like you're describing there that you know you know when it's happening. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, yes. And, and so I think I think one of the things I find really interesting about your work is is the language, you know, this vocabulary and, and the deep study that you're bringing to to this. And so a question I have is, um, you know, in in the context of, of a community of people, um, how do you, how do you just practically open up that space? Um, we know that that dialogue conversation, you know, in in many parts of our society, and certainly on university campuses and so forth, there there are some real barriers to that. There there are subjects that yes. people won't discuss. There there are people who won't talk to certain other people, and so it, it does seem like an extra hurdle to create the space where the kind of the kind of transformation that you're talking about can happen these days. I, I think that's exactly right. And so dialectic into dialogos was never intended to be a, a standalone practice. Um, uh, so it's first of all there's a pedagogical program you teach people some basic meditation some contemplation you teach them some circling practices <clears throat> some authentic listening and communing practices you take them through philosophical fellowship which is kind of like shared lexio divina for a, a, a philosophical text and then you take them into dialectic into dialogos but in addition it's expected that people that go through this program have an already existing ecology of practices uh, that they're doing both as individuals and groups to um, uh, to as much as possible uh, ameliorate uh, self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior and enhance their capacity for profound or more profound connectedness to themselves, to each other, and to the world. And so, if you have the right the ecology of practices, the idea is the dialectic into dialogos gives you a normative guide. It gives you a sense of orientation and navigation for your ecology of practices. And the ecology of practices, of course, make you more and more capable of entering into these challenging uh, forms of interaction, not only interaction with other people, but with yourself, 
the depths of yourself and the depths of sort of your framework for what reality is, your fundamental intelligibility. And so I think if people are not already engaging in an ecology of practices that is getting them to challenge how they are locked into certain ideological positions because of a kind of propositional tyranny, then I do not try to offer this to them. Um, I think people have to commit already to the prospect of truths that are only disclosed in transformation that require what I would call a perspectival and participatory and procedural transformation. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that hurdle has to be crossed before people come into dialectic, into dialogos. There are some very good onboarding practices uh, for doing that. Um, Edwin Reusch has a very good practice called Empathy Circling, in which you can take people who are in an adversarial relationship and it will basically tutor them. Sorry, the garbage truck is going by outside. Okay. Um, <laughs> it will basically it'll basically tutor them uh, into um, a, a different kind of interaction. You have to get people to make the shift where they realize that the best way they can correct themselves and transcend themselves is by deeply listening and seeing through the eyes of another person and then affording that back to the person. You don't have to come into agreement, but you can come mm -hmm. into a more profound communion by which both people can move, both people can give birth to something beyond their normal self, both people can emerge, and they don't have to come to a final agreement. But I, I think it there's... This is why I'm interested in talking to you. I think there's a pedagogical program, an ecology of practices, and a capacity to live in community with other people that needs to be cultivated first before undertaking this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of what you're describing there is, is reminding me a lot of um, when Lena Rachel Anderson, um, who we're going to be speaking with yes. actually next week, is talking about Bildung, this idea coming out of yes. the German Romantics yes. and 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 the and the, and the Danish folk high school movement. Um, and I think you know this this level of of emotional uh, and kind of inner maturity that allows you to separate your identity from your your emotional responses or your ideologies, right? And 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 take up that empathetic position of what does the world look like from the eyes of another person, a person differently situated. It seems like an important skill to develop. <laughs> um, I, I I think that's totally right. I, I I you know, and I've talked to Lenny too, and I I strongly believe, and again, this is why I want to. I am talking to you. Want to continue? That you need to do. You need to be. You need to do something like the Bildung movement. And let's remember, it was successful historically. This is Absolutely. not pie in the sky, right? You, we need something like the Bildung movement for young adults, and then they can go into these ecologies of practices and practice the dialectic into dialogos, etc. Um, I, I totally think that that has to be the case. So I did want to ask you about about circling specifically because um, I haven't yet come across a, like a, a description of what that might look like in practice. Could you give a sense of that? What what that that uh, could you say the creator of that again? The name Guy Sandstock, a good friend of mine, and Guy and Chris and I actually are also co-creators of the circling into the logos workshop that uh, we've done four of those. Um, circling is a practice in which you are developing a kind of mindfulness that is simultaneously deeply with, within yourself so that you are authentically communicating. And, and But the communication is both speaking and listening. There's, uh, there's, both, uh, uh, there's both a more insightful and mindsightful uh, reach into other people, and there's also a profound, because of the mindfulness, receptivity to what they're saying. And so in circling practice, you, you, you're cultivating that info, internal mindfulness, but also an interpersonal mindfulness. And, and so you initially do some practices just to get in sync, to get that, uh, what Siegel calls, mindsight resonance going. You know, I get some insight into you, and you, and then I'm, and I, and I, and I sort of make myself more vulnerable to how I understand your mind to working, so you can get some mindsight into me, and then we reciprocate that process and it accelerates. And what happens is you get into a, a kind of communication that is not about the, the sort of, well, 
it's not it does not emphasize the transmission of information or trying to come and it definitely does not try to come to a conclusion it is trying to get people to uh, experience the communing that is underneath and presupposed by all communication and and do a foreground background flip it's not that the communing is in service of the communication the communication is in service of the communing and so you like Okay, so you do some initial practices where you just get this reciprocal mindfulness and mindset going, um, and and both within and without. I think meditation. I think Siegel's right. A mindfulness is just internalized uh, mindset resonance with yourself. So your mindset resonating with yourself, mindset resonating with other people, and then you get into this this state of deep communing, uh, and it is it is not therapy. And it is not just discussion. It is this third place that language as the vehicle of logos can take you. Um, now, Guy and I, and, and also with Chris's help, um, we realize that that creates a kind of philia, that profound sense of fellowship that was at the core of, well, philosophy and uh, obviously many religious traditions, but that that philia needed to be turned onto something. And so what, one of the things we do with the circling is we get people into that philia and then we turn it onto Sophia, uh, uh, the love of, so you get the fellowship love of wisdom. Um, mm. So circling is something that is fairly easy to get into, uh, but it also um, it doesn't mean it's not transformative and it, event, it very quickly also becomes quite challenging because it has the capacity to uh, open you up quite a bit. So it's often done with a facilitator so that you can walk that razor's edge between, you know, being vulnerable and open and feeling exposed um, and threatened. And so typically uh, most circling practices have a facilitator who's had extensive training in order to help find that razor's edge. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that description. Yeah, that, that seems powerful. The Driftless Folk School, located in the beautiful rolling hills and valleys of southwest Wisconsin, is a community of lifelong learners dedicated to cultivating personal and cultural resilience through hands-on educational experiences. The Driftless Folk School offers classes in agriculture, land stewardship, natural history, folk arts and crafts, herbalism, wilderness skills, and more. For further information on the Driftless Folk School, visit us at driftlessfolkschool.org on the World Wide Web. I'm wondering, I mean, to go to go back for a moment to your your biography, um, you described, you know, coming out of childhood, coming into adulthood, being traumatized in some sense by your by your the context in which you grew up, and not everyone comes out of a fundamentalist religious background, but I do think that what you're describing there is is increasingly very common um, in, in young people that I'm seeing, um, that they're, they're coming out of an experience, and maybe everyone coming out of the last few years um, is traumatized yeah. at, some, at some notable level. They're, 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 there's a, some sort of a blockage in, in, in kind of accessing some of these deeper you know, wellsprings that you're talking about, um, but also a real sense of, of hunger for meaning. Um, and I'm wondering if you if you could reflect back on your your biography. I mean, would you have been ready to step into this kind of circling work, coming a, as an 18 or 19 year old, or or what had to happen before you could even be considered doing something like this? Yeah, uh, excellent question. I think the the clear answer to me is, you know, initially no. Um, I was too. I only know this retrospectively and having gone through therapy and uh, decades of practice, um, but I was too raw and wounded uh, uh, for that. I think, uh, I think having an ecology of practices really helped me, uh, doing the meditation, doing the contemplation, doing the Tai Chi Chuan, um, and then starting to, as I say, understand uh, our own wisdom traditions through philosophy as a way of life, especially the Socratic Platonic tradition. I was able to return to that, uh, especially through the work of Pierre Hadot and others, Arthur Vers Lewis and many other people, um, and all the all the third way Platonists uh, into a deeper understanding and reappropriation and reapprehension and recognition uh, of that whole. 
uh, pathway. Um, and I think only at that place was I ready for the kind of social intimacy uh, that uh, circling can bring. I think, though, if younger adults were given this Bildung education, they could enter into circling much earlier than I would, because first of all, they would um, earlier on start to address um, the meaning crisis, and they would also start to develop the kind of character and the kinds of virtues that um, act as a bulwark when you start to explore these more powerful transformative practices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, elsewhere you've described the meaning crisis, what's going on in our society as in, in Western culture as a, as a famine of wisdom, a wisdom famine. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, when, when a person is starving, they will put yeah. anything into their belly. <laughs> um, exactly, and I think when they, when they were liberating the, the, uh, the Jewish prisoners from the concentration camps, they had to be very careful how they fed them. Yeah. Because if they allowed those people to eat according to their hunger, they would often die uh, because they were so close to starva- like starving to death. Um, because when you take in food, you have to initially expend a lot of energy to break it down, right? Um, and it's the same way. When people are in a, in a kind of profound scarcity uh, mentality, yeah, you have to feed them very carefully. Um, as, and especially when they are already going through um, adolescence. Um, I was I was lucky um, I, in that I read a bunch of really powerful books that helped me. Uh, but having human uh, adult human beings who could live out and interpret the content of those books to me would have been profoundly beneficial and helpful to me. Yeah. Yes, something that, that um, in, in this podcast uh, series, we've been, a number of the people we've, we've uh, uh, interviewed have been educators, university professors, people with, with multi-decade careers working with young adults. And something that I'm interested to, in, in, in knowing from a person like yourself who, who's done that, um, especially with your, your focus on these questions, is what changes, what's, have you, what's different, if anything, from young people today that you've worked with at the university level um, as opposed to when you started? Is, is there, is there a, like a through line or a direction of transformation that you can see, and, and how has that contributed to your, your, your understanding of what's going on? Um, so there's been an, I mean, there's always been, as, as you said, and uh, the term you use is there's always been this hunger, um, but I've seen it intensify tremendously. Um, it's not only a wisdom famine, a sense of domicide and almost a sense of lostness, hopelessness, and it's interacting uh, with, with their appreciation of all of the issues, the, ex- the X risk factors that the, the planet is facing. Um, and that, that is, they feel a tremendous responsibility and also the lack of education to prepare prepare them for that responsibility. Um, mm. So uh, they bear, I can see them, and they also bear the burden of the ways in which our culture has misled them. Our culture has, I think, and I think this is the right, ad, right adverb, viciously misled them into believing that their romantic relationships can carry all the burden that God and wisdom and a life of virtue and character and belonging to a tradition and belonging to a community and fellowship, that your romantic relationship can do all of that for you. And I think that's just absolute, well, I don't mean to be vulgar, I'm using it in the technical technical sense. I think that's absolute bullshit. And, um, I, and I think that I see them bearing that. Um, I also see that their resiliency is collapsing uh, they're very, very, and, I, and this is not meant as a criticism. It's meant as an honest, observational answer to your question. I see them as very incapable of dealing uh, with the stresses of life, even the university life. Uh, I don't mean comprehensively. I'm talking about a greater proportion of students. Mm-hmm. Um, just don't seem to have that resiliency, that depth, that cognitive flexibility. There's a overwhelm the mental health crisis at the universities is 
astonishing and overwhelming. Um, and the amount of accommodation and the amount of things we need to do in order to try and ameliorate this. Uh, the universities, are, right, and the, and, and the hospitals um, are the places in which we are demanding the in, these institutions deal with all of the fallout of the meaning crisis without, of course, doing anything to properly um, educate the people at the hospitals or the universities. Um, uh, and so it's, it's just overwhelming at times. Jacob, that's mm -hmm. it's in a way it wasn't ten years ago. In the way, it, in the way it was not even on like, uh, like I said, pe pe even twenty years ago, people were hungry about the meaning crisis, but not like now. Uh, the suffering is just so much more, so much more intense. Yeah, one of the one of the ideas that really stood out for me from reading um, zombies in Western culture was this concept of domicide. Um, yes, and, and it's, it seems like a powerful concept that 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 is is it's flexible also to address several different manifestations. Um, but certainly in young people I've worked with, you know, whether they are focused on on the environment, or they're focused on war and international politics, or if they're focused on let's say cultural issues, political polarization, mm -hmm. moral issues like that, um, there there's a sense of this this word domicide covers a lot of that that sensibility yeah. and i wondered yeah. if yeah for could you give a definition of that for our listeners oh I, I got that term from brian walsh who got it from fortius and smith and his the, the sense of domicide is the sense of that your home has been killed it's like homicide but with domicile right so uh, domicide is the killing of home now there's two ways that happens one is the physical destruction of shelter the other is people can have shelter and nevertheless not feel at home they can feel alienated, lonely. They can feel sort of culture shocked within their own culture. Um, they can feel uh, very, uh, that even the cosmos and the world uh, are being lost or being rendered absurd, meaningless. Um, that, that's domicide. And, and, and what you see, the universities, and I think elsewhere, I talked to uh, Rusha Modi, a doctor, he's seen, People are trying to turn these institutions in the home, into the homes they're longing for, but they don't know. They don't know what they're looking for. They think of home just as that. What that means is where they feel the most safe, the most comfortable, because they've adopted sort of the North American BS about what home means. Um, and and you can see them trying uh, to make the university home. And I, I really have, I think, significant compassion for that. But I think often. They have a bad and misdirected image, misdirecting image of what that home, what home means. Um, and I think they're looking for the kind of multi-scaled environment that, well, cultivates bildunk and uh, and launches people into uh, the, the the transformative aspirational quest for wisdom. That's what home should do. Uh, you know, it, and when we think of um, other ancient attempts to re to extend the notion of home, like the monastery or the church um, or the temple or the mosque, um, you can see that that's actually the kind of thing we're needing. I'm not advocating a return to religion, tradition, the legacy of religions. Neither am I uh, are, am I arguing uh, against it. By and large, most adolescents are typically this is the rise of the nuns the n-o-n-e-s's mm -hmm. are, are are not uh, identifying with one of the legacy religions but that doesn't mean they're satisfied with a kind of uh new atheism instead they're they they, they they use this nebulous very nebulous phrase spiritual but not religious mm -hmm. and the thing that would answer that properly um is what i think they're looking for with home but I don't think the university actually can, especially the way it's being directed by their hunger, um, will, is actually meeting that need in a real way. Yeah. Um, Are you familiar I, with... I, I, I go, go ahead. ahead. Are you familiar with this? There's, there's a group called Nuns and Nuns, <laughs> um, which is N-O-N-E-S and N-U-N-S. I didn't know this. 
So we're, we're going to be interviewing some people involved with this in, in a couple of weeks on the podcast, and I'll... I'll share that with you when that comes out. But this is an organization that is basically connecting. Um, so in traditional uh, Catholic religious uh, orders, there's, of course, a real crisis of membership, right? There's there's a lot of empty beds in the convents yeah. and monasteries um, as people, you know, people aid and die and, and, and not are not replaced. Um, and uh, and so that in our in our region here in Wisconsin, there are several such places Um that are really trying to think about what do we do? Where, what do we do with our land, with our facilities? Um, so there's a group that has, has been formed working across the United States, which has um, put these religious orders and their members in connection with young people, you know, millennial or younger people who are, um, who are interested in, they're not interested in becoming nuns or monks, but they are interested in the kind of structure of life, and they're yep. they're, they're defined really as they are self-identified nuns, people who are who are not religious. They are in, they they are not affiliated with a religion, um, but they are they and, and in fact they they've organized basically them to to live in the convents, <laughs> and kind of participate in the in the rhythms of life, in the schedule of the day, in the shared kind of like service work, um, and, and and so there's an interest you know from from younger people and these are of course some people in there into middle life now who are um they're, they're they're attracted to the structure of the life in the in the religious religious order even if they have no connection or interest in the in the the creed or in the in the kind of content yep. of the religion which was yeah. a fascinating yeah. phenomenon <laughs> well, well first of all jacob if you could put me in touch with this person after the podcast i would appreciate it yeah uh, secondly uh, the the rise of secular monasteries it, 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 like this is significant. I, uh, I, you know, I was at Maple in August, which is, you know, it it comes out of the Zen tradition, but um, it, it 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 doesn't require you to be a Buddhist in order to go to the monastery. It's very very similar, and and and, and there's one that's opened up just outside of Toronto, Willow, a friend of mine, uh, Seishen or Yasna, uh, she's running it. More and more, this is happening, and more and more these. These, the, there's ecologies of practices within, you know, intentional communities uh, in which people are trying to address this issue. This, this is this this is an ongoing thing, and and I'm more and more uh, trying to get these people to talk to each other, get them to have a shared framework, get them to help uh, help each other. Not just me alone doing this. There's many of us are engaged in this project of trying to. Uh, properly create a community out of all of these communities and these secular monasteries and, and it's just it shows you how much people are seeking the religio that that fundamental sense of connectedness even if they no longer um, find value in, in the credo and, and it's happening all over the place Jacob uh, I know because I, I'm involved in it I, that's why I want to talk to this person who's the, the nuns for nuns that, that's amazing yeah yeah they um yeah i'll share i'll share what i have with them uh with you after afterwards for sure um yeah i think in 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 the your book on zombies you also point to you point to a couple of examples of of domicides one is a, a contemporary example from from the first nations anishinaabe um yeah. community in canada yeah. uh, which was was moved to a new site and and it had a real just some terrible outcomes there. The other is on a civilizational level, the sort of the late the Hellenistic period, or I think probably you could say extend that to generally the late classical period in in the ancient world, yeah. um, which yeah. more and more resembles our our current time. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. And yes. it is interesting that that is the environment that the monasteries in the West came out of, right? That was one response. Yes. Yep, very much. The monasteries, and then all. All of the philosophical schools that were were bound by this sort of notion of, of the philosopher as the physician of the soul or the psyche, you know, Stoicism, Epicureanism, mm -hmm. and of course the the great unifying, you know, unified field theory of all of this, which was Neoplatonism, mm -hmm. um, and then when it integrated with Christianity, uh, that gave a comprehensive framework. So you see people building these new. Uh, philosophies of the way of life, building the new, building monasteries. Um, yeah, and all of this is, there's similar signs uh, happening right now, as you point out. And I, and I do not think that's a coincidence. I, I mean, the book that I wrote with Christopher Master Pietro and Philip uh, uh, Misovic, I mean, 
how do I want to say this? As a as a concerned person, I, I uh, I'm distressed by the fact that it was quite accurate in its <laughs> sort of foretelling of how things were going to unfold. As a scientist, I'm pleased uh, because it means uh, you know that I, I we're, we are on the track of the truth. But that that truth is is a is a very is a is a, is a very demanding one. It's a very challenging one, and we need more and more to create the alternative culture that is going to be able to meet that demand. Yeah, yeah, I definitely see see my work as an educator and more and more you know, having to, to to directly address despair. And yes, and, yes, yeah, and that and that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And and, and despair untreated is is fatal. Yeah. Um, and um, and the death, the number of deaths of despair, and of course the people that are, you know, the great resignation and the quiet quitting and the staying in bed movements and all these all these forms of protest that are happening right now are people basically saying um, they they don't want to go back to the ashen world um, it, that they experience largely as meaningless. They want some kind of significant change. Thoreau College is a leader in an emergent movement dedicated to the renewal and revitalization of higher education through the creation of new, humanly scaled institutions with holistic curricula known as micro-colleges. Thoreau College, higher education for the whole human being. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, as, as, as a, you know, part of our ecology of practices here at Thoreau College and at several of the other micro-college uh, initiatives that we're connected with, um, the, you know, if yeah, if, if if one of the the phenomena you know of of our present world is are people kind of dropping out, quiet quitting, and, and their work often, which is on a computer or a screen, um, yeah. you know, right at the core of what we're doing here are things that you are are, are manual labor. Um, so farming, yep. gardening, working in the kitchen, woodworking. Um, we had a group of students this spring who put shingles on roofs. You know. Um, you know, manual service in the local community, working with children, um, but especially just practical things done with the hands are, are you know, the core of what, what we're doing. And this is something that we, we get from the Waldorf tradition and from our inspiration from Deep Springs College and from the life of Henry David Thoreau, who famously boiled his own cabin and, and grew his own beans. Um, and I'm wondering what, you know, what your work, what your insights share, um, uh, what light could be shed on, on this aspect, this, this type of practice as a, as a component of a, of a community or a curriculum that's devoted to, to meaning making and, and addressing these crises we're talking about? Well, given the, the, the arguments that I've made uh, from cognitive science uh, uh, about the embodied, enacted, embedded, and extended nature of, uh, of cognition, uh, sensory motor crafting, especially in concert with other people, is essential to educating uh, cognition at the level that we're talking about, at the level at which it reaches into character formation and bildung. What I'm saying is, once you understand that cognition is primarily not sort of computation, standalone computation done inside the brain, but this enacted um, engagement with the world, and especially with and through other people, and I'm publishing papers on this, then um, moving with other people, having movement practices, uh, uh, sensory motor contact, uh, like martial art practices, and then crafting together um, practices, uh, I think and there's a reason why these were all in the monasteries. It wasn't just to make them self-sufficient because of the Middle Ages. It's, it's because they have pro pro profound pedagogical consequences. I think uh, I think all of these need uh, a greater emphasis. We're still seeing a lot of these emerging ecologies, uh, practices. They're doing mindfulness stuff. Uh, they're doing some dialogical stuff. Um, uh, but there's there's, the, there's these domains of movement, uh, 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 of contact, martial arts. Uh, of crafting in concert with others um, are, are missing. And that means that we are still not properly accessing and actualizing um, the kinds of knowing that are fundamental for a sense of ratio religio, a, a properly proportioned connectedness to oneself 
um, to others in the world um, and, and to the and to the world itself so if you understand the emerging 4e framework of cognition then you, you all of these things uh, are needed I think we also need uh, you know, music and the arts. Also, yeah. I was going to mention um, singing. Uh, you know, singing. If if you follow, you know, the through line of the monasteries, the the Danish folk yes, schools, together. Waldorf schools, like that. That that is. Uh, you know, it combines a lot of these things. You know, it, it is yes. the content. There's beautiful imagery, but there's also just the breathing together, the coordination. It is also yep. embodied in yep. an important way. Yes, uh, singing together, chanting together, moving together. Um, all of these things are very, very important. Yes, yes, uh, and, and um, it it also gives people. You want to give people a sense of mastery. I don't mean dominance, but the, the sense of that their agency is effective at satisfying fundamental human needs and drives, because that removes an often unnoticed background level of anxiety from yeah. people. Oh, so. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that certainly is, is something I, I see as core to what we're doing here, that if, if people do have some sense of, of being able to feed themselves, yeah. um, even if it's just cooking something they bought in a store, right, just that level of feeding themselves, not to mention, you know, fixing things in the house where they're living, working together as a group. So we, we do, you know, meetings, decision making, you know, consensus building kind of activities to, to, to decide practical things. What should the schedule be? What, you know, what, what are we going to do? Um, you know, that's also something that's incorporated to our, our expeditions curriculum, um, which is another thing I wanted to ask about if you had any insight about. I, I, last night in preparing for this, I also came across some of your recent interviews with folks who are you know, doing nature immersions and, 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 and expeditions, yeah. um, which is also an important part of our curriculum. Can you say anything more about that? How does that fit in to your, to your vision? Very much so. I mean, that is the other essential dimension, uh, in addition to the ones we were just talking about. I did return to the source with Rafe Kelly um, and I, also with Kyle Koch and both of them. Um, Kyle's video is already on my channel. Rafe's coming out today, uh, sorry, on Friday. Um, nature connectedness practices and Rafe and Kyle both have, and they work together as well. And, and Ben Sanford at Tribal Edge as well. These are, these are people who are doing just fantastic work at creating ecologies and practices around nature connection. Um, and that's the other essential dimension. So uh, I think what we're seeing is people realizing that there can be considerable variations as long as all of these fundamental dimensions of, uh, uh, of the cultivation of wisdom are being addressed, like nature connection, uh, music and the arts, movement, contact, crafting together, mindfulness practices, uh, dialogical practices, uh, uh, you know, deep reading practices like Fio Divina, Philosophical Fellowship. Um, as long as you, like, as, as long as these dimensions and their appropriate tasks are properly matched, you can have a lot of variation in this specific content. Um, and I'm not saying it's unlimited, uh, but we're seeing the possibility of something that is genuinely pluralistic, namely, we can take this meta curriculum and we can map it into different cultural historical contexts and so that it fits that situation and uh, but nevertheless there's a universality in terms of the dimensions and the kinds of skills and virtues that address those dimensions uh, that need, that go into your meta curriculum that's something in fact I'm working on with other people right now to get clear about that meta curriculum um, and I think that's something that we need to think about uh, right now but definitely one of the one of the important dimensions is nature connection practices that has to be in any ecology of practices yeah to me it's it seems it's a similar or, and maybe identical famine to the to the wisdom famine right that people are people are have got a deep hunger for just just being on the earth right to to be attention yes. to the changes yes. of the so we build our programs around the changes of the seasons one of the advantages uh, of living here in the in the temperate climates in the northern part of the of the continent um we have these changes of the seasons the the cycles of the stars the the the, the agricultural cycles are, are you know in some ways the, the foundation of our curriculum 
And I do think that that's, that's meeting another a hunger that people are feeling. Where am I, you know, another sense of, of, of home, right, is, is, is really on the, on the earth and its natural cycles. That's brilliant, Jacob. That's absolutely mm-hmm. brilliant. So I think, you know, in, 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 you know, in the whole picture of, of a meaning crisis, of an ecology of practices, you know, some things, you know, we, we've talked a bit about um, practices that might be thought of as traditionally part of a, a religious tradition. So meditation, but also, you know, communal rituals um, and, and um, storytelling you know, related to, to these, these big paradig- par- paradigmatic kind of questions. Um, something that we have... You know, we've bumped up uh, occasionally in our early programs here. Is you know, like like you, there are people who are um, who have you know have had traumatic experiences or just any, anything um, with the flavor of of the supernatural. It sets up a real defense response, um, yeah. for good reasons. Um, but also, um, so I, in the creation of a community, even one that's working towards these higher levels of being able to discuss. Um, how, how how can we do you think how could a community w- work with that that kind of dis- defense response you could say uh, while keeping that really important part of a part of a like a cultural structure the canopy you could say of a of a you know of, of, a, of a practice that does recognize the supernatural or, or at least is open to that um <laughs> yeah um that, that, that's the, that is the question that I keep, as you said, I keep bumping up against. Uh, for me, um, getting, you know, t- as I just said, understanding the, the genuine pluralism, which is in between, you know, an absolutism and a relativism, the, the, the pluralism of this, that um, there are dimensions that sh- need to be addressed. Uh, we have to enhance relevance realization in all of these dimensions. We we have to deal with the non-propositional kinds of knowing. We've been touching upon all of this. We basically have to help people um, uh, cultivate wisdom, connectedness, uh, intimacy, um, the capacity to fall in love with the world again. Um, the, all of that, and, and then, like I said, and then meta practices like dialectic into dialogos um, all of that can be done in a way that has like a philosophical framework to it and I don't just mean academic philosophy mm-hmm. I mean uh, this is why I'm interested I'm interested I, I sort of describe myself half jokingly as a Zen neoplatonist because <laughs> uh, Zen, Zen is the great integration which I sort of unfolded in my life between Taoism and Buddhism and, and Zen is a sophisticated ecology of practices. Uh, sorry, sophisticated ecology of practices uh, for always prioritizing religio, uh, religio over credo. Mm-hmm. And then Neoplatonism is basically, as I said, the grand unifying philosophical framework for the cultivation of wisdom and transcendence from the West. And, and I'm using them as templates. Um, for how we can create something like what we had in the Silk Road that stretched between the East and the West, between right Taoism and Buddhism and Neoplatonism and um, Islam and, and, and Judaism and, and different forms of Christianity. Yeah, all of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and Neoplatonism was able to enter into reciprocal reconstruction with Christianity, uh, Judaism, Islam. Uh, it looks like aspects of uh, Vedanta. It's currently in doing that with respect to um, Buddhism. Um, and so um, I think we can create this sort of courtyard where we have a shared framework, a shared vocabulary, um, a shared uh, theoretical grammar for discourse, a, a shared ecology of practices and, uh, and, and, uh, and meta practices, and yet we they can in that courtyard you can find people that are nuns but you could also find jews and buddhists and Taoists and christians and i don't think this is a facile hope because that is that is what people are telling me about my work they're telling me that those who have come from no religious tradition that it's 
helping them ameliorate the meaning crisis, but many people have also said that it, is a, as it has afforded them returning to their religious heritage and it coming alive for them again. And so I think it's possible to do exactly what I'm describing to you. And um, it takes... <laughs> It, it takes a, it takes a very careful and very careful kind of attention and responsiveness and responsibility and, and a kind of on like and I mean this very seriously a, a humility in order for that to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, I, I think when I'm working with with my students, you know, I feel like the sign that that it's working that going in the right direction is is some sense of openness to to all kinds of things and I guess that's expressed really in a curiosity and th there's a sense of security yeah. you know this sort of the the hierarchy of needs would suggest you need to to feel some level of security in order to to then be open to these higher yeah. level things and so that that certainly is, is is a first focus but you know something I appreciate about being alive uh, in this period of history is we do we have this incredible ability to to, to learn about all of these different traditions. And, and you know, I think similar to that Silk Road era or the late antiquity, there is an opportunity to, to put together some, some sets of perspectives, symbolic systems, um, spiritual traditions and practices in, in new and, and really rich ways in a way that is most people in history have not had the chance to do. So I, my hope is that my, that my students get a chance to, to, to approach that moment with a lot of curiosity and love for the world. That, that uh, it sounds to me like you're doing exactly that, <laughs> um, which I, I, I think is re really, really powerful and important. Yeah, we important. We have we have something even greater. The internet is is is, is, is the ultimate Silk Road, uh, at least in potential. Um, and, and and if we could properly actualize that, I think we can create these courtyards where people can enter into fellowship um, in a pro profoundly philosophical way while not having to abandon the particular uh, place where they feel most spiritually at home. Yeah. Beautiful. I think, John, we, we're up at the end of the hour here that we that you set aside for us, which I'm really grateful for. Um, I'm looking forward to speaking to you again um, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll be, yeah. uh, John will be interviewing me next time for Voices with Verveke, yeah. which is I'm really looking forward to, to pick up this conversation. So... But thank you so much for your time and for all of your, your work and your, your evident sort of love and enthusiasm for, for young people and for, and for the world. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, yeah, please send me the links to this so I can review it uh, before our meeting. Great. We'll do. All right. Have a good day. Take good care.